a brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jogler 66, Hour of the Truth, or Yerk, as some people also know me by my right, <laughs> by my real name. Um, this will be the third reading of uh, the wonderful book that Martin Luther wrote in 1545, Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil. But as you remember, in the last reading I ended with telling you that... Um, the emperor, Phocas, was the one who actually, quote-unquote, founded the papacy, founded the universal bishop. And that before he did that, and making Pope Boniface III the first pope, before that time we speak not of popes, but we speak of bishops of Rome, that the bishop of Rome before that, Pope Gregory the Great, he is called in the history today, even though he was just a bishop, because that's the point I'm going to make, who lived between 540 and 604 AD, uh, AD, yeah, AD in our time, said in a letter to Emperor Mauritius, and by the way, this Mauritius, very interesting, this Emperor Mauritius, that the Bishop of Rome, called Pope Gregory the Great, addressed to, is the one that Phocas murdered. We have just read that this same Phocas, as it uh, reads in the book of Martin Luther on page 277, this same Phocas, as a regicide in Constantinople, murdered his lord, the Emperor Maurice, and his wife and children. That is, Maurice is Mauritius. Mauritius is just the Latin version of Maurice. Okay? So, the Pope, or the, the Bishop of Rome, to the Emperor before Phocas wrote, quote, Moreover, I say confidently that anyone calling himself universal priest, or distressed to be so called, shows himself by this self-exaltation, to be the forerunner to the Antichrist, because by this display of pride he sets himself superior to others. Unquote. This is what the Bishop of Rome, Gregory the Great, wrote in a letter to the Emperor of the Roman Empire, Mauritius or Maurice, to state that, watch out, when there will come a universal bishop, a universal priest, a bishop who exalts himself above all other bishops, that one will be, as he said, the forerunner to Antichrist. And we know, of course, when we look back into history, that he is not the forerunner of, Christ, uh, of, of Antichrist, that he is the Antichrist, as the popes are today. You can always do your own study on this, but I think this is very important, because otherwise you are bound to accept the teaching of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You can believe whatever you want, but I, for my part, I want to have the truth, the unbridled truth. And the Seventh-day Adventists are a church that I do not believe in. I do not believe in any denomination. I don't believe the Lutherans, the Methodists, the Baptists, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Calvinists, whatever. I believe the Bible, Sola Scriptura. And I try to do decent research in history. 
And as I told you before, Martin Luther mentions here that the Bishop of Rome at that time, called Pope Gregory the Great, who reigned between 450 and 604, or lived between 550 and 604, wrote in the letter to the Emperor Mauritius, or Maurice, what I just read to you, quote, Moreover, I say confidently that anyone calling himself universal priest or desires to be so called shows himself by this self-exaltation to be the forerunner to the Antichrist because by this display of pride he sets himself superior to others. Unquote. Now this is exactly the same thing that we can read in the Bible in Isaiah 14. When Lucifer exalts himself above all others and wants to be like the Most High, you see, the bishop that claims to be universal priest, universal bishop, and that's the title of the popes today, he who does that is, in the eyes of the bishop of Rome at that time, Gregory the Great, the precursor or the forerunner to the Antichrist. I would go so far and say, Gregory the Great himself was a forerunner of the Antichrist, and then Pope Boniface the Third, the one who took as at very first the title Universal Bishop, because he got the power from Emperor Phocas, as we have read in the book of uh, Martin Luther, that. This focus gave the power to the then Bishop of Rome, Boniface III. That's the one who succeeded Gregory the Great, the title of Universal Bishop, Pontifex Maximus. And that happened in the year 606. And from 606 to 1866, 1260 years, three and a half prophetical years, 42 months, you have the reign of the Antichrist. Now you say, but what about 1798? What about the teaching of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Well, the point is that in 1866, the protective guards of France, who protected the Pope against the upcoming Italian Republic, that took away the temporal power of the Pope, left the Vatican and left the Vatican without any defense. So, the point being that because of the tr this retreat in 1866 of the French troops, the Vatican was left alone, was exposed, and the power of the then forming Italian, Italian Republic could take over and the temporal power of the Pope was taken away. Now, as a consequence, the Pope, the reigning Pope at that time, who was Pope Pius IX, locked himself inside the Vatican. That prison had a key from the inside. And the very first thing that that Pope then did was convening the First Vatican Council in 1870, where the infallibility of the papacy was declared and made dogma within the Roman Catholic Church. Now, why did he do that? Because he had lost all his temporal power. The world at that moment thought, well, the Jesuits were gone because they were forbidden in 1773 already, and now even the Pope has no, no temporal power anymore. Because the temporal power is taken away. His protecting troops were gone. And Italy formed its republic. Italy could have never formed its republic if the Pope had the temporal power over the whole world, right? And from 1870 until 1929, when the wound started to heal again, the Vatican was a prison with the key on the inside. But that, of course, didn't take away the spiritual power of the Pope. And therefore, we read in Revelation 13, I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. 
one of his heads. That head is the political, the secular, the civil power, the temporal power of the Pope. That head looked as if it was wounded to, uh, to death. I want you to understand this. And I want to ask you to do your own research in this regard. You don't have to believe me, but I ask you also to take off your SDA glasses through which most of the people see, and also I did. And I don't only have the account of Martin Luther in this book, Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil, that he wrote in 1545, I also rely on the writings of Alexander Hislop, who published his book for the very first time in 1853, The Two Babylons, and he was not a Seventh-day Adventist, and he didn't have any Seventh-day Adventist glasses off, and he speaks of the same reigning time of the Antichrist of the prophetical 1260 years between 606 and 1866. And also Henry Gretton Guinness, in his wonderful work that you can follow on all my three channels, Romanism and the Reformation, that Tom Fress from Inquisition Update reads there, refers to the time between 606 and 1866. Now my point is the following. All the people that I just spoke of, Martin Luther, Alexander Hislop, and Henry Gretton Guinness. All three were no Seventh-day Adventists. And today, all over the world, the accepted teaching of the 1260-year reign of Antichrist is between 538 and 1798. And that is because of the teaching of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I just don't trust the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They were formed by Freemasons. Do your own research on that. Freemasons are on the top controlled by the Jesuit order. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is one of the largest, or well, is the largest, quote-unquote, Protestant congregation worldwide. Next to the Roman Catholic Church, I think it is the second biggest Christian, quote-unquote, Christian church in the world. Catholicism is not Christian, so that's why I put it in brackets or quotation marks. And of course, the SDA Church is not truly Christian, but also ecumenical and going back to under the wings of Rome. They have wonderful history teachers, I admit that. Among them Bill Hughes, who you know made the devil sign, I made a video on that, and teaches the also biblically wrong explanation of the 2300 years prophecy from Daniel, that it's 2300 years, not 2300 days. That's another thing where I have to make a video on like Walter Veit, who is a very well-studied historian. I do not deny that. So when you go to people like these, well, then you really have to very, very be careful that you understand the truth and history they tell and that you can divide the lies from the truth that they tell biblically with their false interpretation of biblical prophecy. Because if you want to understand Daniel, Paul and John correctly, you only need the Bible, the 1611 King James Bible that explains itself. You don't need these people. You don't need a priest. You don't need someone who teaches you from the pulpit, who is Jesuit trained through seminaries. You need the Bible and the Bible alone. So, just going back this one little time again to the, f uh, to the uh, quote that we read here from the uh, Pope Gregory, or 
the Bishop of Rome, Gregory the Great, to the Emperor Mauritius. Moreover, I say confidently that anyone calling himself universal priest or desires to be so called shows himself by this self-exaltation to be the forerunner to the Antichrist, because, this, uh, because by this display of pride, of pride he sets himself superior to others. Display of pride, what else is Isaiah chapter 14 speaking about? You know, when we have to recall this, I'm just going to put that up here. Let me just get to Isaiah 14 in the King James Version. And we remember that from verse 12 on it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. This pride that was found in Lucifer was his fall from heaven. This pride of calling himself universal bishop of the Pope was the reason that he became the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist. Now, with this little introduction, I want to go back to the book and I will again repeat the very last paragraph on page 276 before we continue the reading in the book of Martin Luther against the Roman papacy, an institution of the devil. And I hope that you consider everything that I just told you. Very well, Martin Luther says. Let it continue as long as it can. The emperor and empire must swallow this kind of rascality. This is not the first emperor with whom the incorrigible rascal in Rome has played like that. They have not spared a single one since they came to power. Maximilian's, uh, Maximilian I, the predecessor of Charles V, Maximilian's greatest complaint was that no pope had ever kept faith with him. I should think this Emperor Charles V has truly experienced the same thing with Clement VII, Leo X, and now Paul III. In summary, they are all the creatures and heirs of the Emperor Phocas, who first established the papacy in Rome, and whom they loyally fall. This same focus, as a regicide in Constantinople, murdered his lord, the Emperor Maurice, and his wife and children. The popes do this kind of thing too. If they could not themselves murder the German emperors, as Clement IV had the noble Conradin, the last Duke of Swabia and hereditary King of Naples publicly executed with the sword, if they had not been able to kill the emperors with treachery and every diabolical wickedness, it is nevertheless their definite intention, and their regret has always been that their bloodthirsty, murderous, evil intentions have been foiled and prevented. The descendants of the Emperor Phocas, their founder and regicide, are, as was said, desperate through uh, thor uh, thorough arch rascals, sorry, the descendants of the Emperor Phocas, their founder and regicide, are, as was said, desperate, thorough arch rascals, murderers, traitors, liars, the very scum of all the most evil men on earth, as it is said in Rome itself. They embellish themselves with the names of Christ, Saint Peter, and the Church, even though they are full of all the worst devils in hell, full, 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 and so full that they can do nothing but vomit, throw, and blow out devils. You will say that this is true when you read the histories of how they have treated the emperors. Very well, 
as I have said, the Emperor Charles V and his empire must swallow the gibberish of the rascal in Rome, Antichrist Pope Paul III, and it really does not yet harm us very much. But it does help to see of Rome, uh, but it does help the see of Rome to uncover themselves front and rear, and let us see into their behinds, so that we can know them. Until now we had to believe that the Pope was the head of the Church, the most holy, the Saviour of all Christendom. Now we see that he with his Roman cardinals is nothing but a desperate scoundrel, the enemy of God and man, the destroyer of Christendom and Satan's bodily dwelling, who through him only harms both Church and State like a werewolf and mocks and laughs up his sleeves, while he hears that such hurts God or man more of this later. I have to include a story here from which one I can tell what to think of the holy rascals and murderers of the Roman See. In the year of the Lord 1510, if I remember correctly, I was in Rome and heard tell this story about seven German miles this side of Rome there is a spot called Ronchiglione where I lived at the time of uh, where I uh, where I lived at the time of Paul II who reigned 70 years ago a papal official who saw the blasphemous devilish nature of the Pope and his scum in Rome and did not give the Pope his annual tax from his office the Pope sent for him he did not come and whatever the Pope ordered to him, he ignored. Finally, the Pope put him under the ban, means excommunicated him, but he did not care about this either. After this, the Pope had him told out with bells and thrown out and damned with lights extinguished from the pulpit as is, this, as is the custom. This did not bother him either. At last, because such obstinate disobedience to the Pope in his canon law must be called heresy, he had the official's portrait drawn on paper with many devils over his head and on both sides and had it brought to court, accused and sentenced to the stake for heresy. Then straight away he took the paper to the fire and burned it. The official also had a portrait of the Pope amid his, his cardinal, uh, cardinals drawn on paper, with lots of devils above and around them, called the court into session, and the Pope and cardinals were accused as the worst scoundrels living on earth, doing immeasurable harm to poor people, and if their leader were to die, they would diligently set in his place the very worst one they could find among themselves. They were surely worthy of hellfire, and many witnesses testified to all this. Then the judge, then the judge, the official, and the plaintiff stepped forth and declared that they should be burned. And quickly, in the name of a thousand devils, he put a picture of the Pope and cardinals into the fire to burn them until the Pope forcefully drove him out. This story is perhaps ridiculous. But it nevertheless points out a horrible misfortune, that the Pope, with his abominable, diabolical nature, causes extraordinarily damaging offence in Rome, and the people who see this stumble over it and become quite as, uh, Epicurean, just as he himself is. Remember, Epicurean means godless. Indeed, almost everyone who comes back from Rome brings along a papal conscience, that is, an Epicurean belief, a godless belief. For this is certain, that the popes and cardinals, including his school of scoundrels, believe in nothing. They laugh when they hear something said of faith. And I myself in Rome heard it said openly in the streets, quote, if there is a hell then Rome is built on it, unquote. That is, quote, after the devil himself there is no worse folk than the Pope and his followers, unquote. That is why it is no wonder that they fear a free council and shun the light. 
but they have one basis on which they stand, namely, they believe their estate, their office and teaching is right. So, even though the people are evil, one could neither judge nor condemn the office and the doctrine. Thus, they go on, do whatever they want, convinced that nothing can happen to their office, of which we shall say more later. This was a very powerful little story Luther told here. And I think that his experience that when he visited Rome, he said, indeed, almost everyone who comes back from Rome brings along a papal conscience that is an Epicurean belief, for this is certain, he says, that the popes and cardinals, including a school of scoundrels, believe in nothing. They laugh when they hear something said of faith. And I myself, I, Luther myself, when I was in Rome, heard it said openly in the streets, if there is a hell, then Rome is built on it, that after the devil himself there is no worse folk than the Pope and his followers. Now what has changed between the time of 1510 when Luther was in Rome and experienced this and the time of 2017 that we live in today in this regard? Nothing. Because Rome never changes. If there is a hell, Rome must be built on it. That was valid in the time of Luther and that is valid in the time that we live in today. After the devil himself there is no worse folk than the Pope and his followers that was valid at the time of Luther and that is valid in the time today. There is no worse folk than the Pope and his followers. The curia, the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church of the synagogue of Satan. The Church of Antichrist. And of course, that is why Luther says, it is no wonder that they fear a free council and they shun the light. Yeah, because the lie always tries to hide from the light, the truth, the word of God. Now we continue, and even if they would be reformed in a council, <laughs> now here we speak now about the quote-unquote reformation, <laughs> even if they were reformed in a council, which is not going to happen because the synagogue of Satan is irreformable, even if they would be reformed in a council, which really is not possible, Luther admits right here, so there is no reformation. There is no reformation, but there is a return to real apostolic Christianity. There is a starting, a building, a pillar of Protestantism, of protesting the Antichrist. But Luther said it himself, right here. Even if they would, uh, if they would be reformed in a council, which, is really, which really is not possible. Luther admits it himself. There is no reformation. You cannot reform the Roman Catholic Church. You can only come out of her, my people, that you do not receive of her sins and that you do not be partake, uh, that you do not be partakers of her sins and that you do not receive of her plagues, because God has remembered her iniquities. Revelation 18 verse 4. It really is not possible to reform the church in a council, and the Pope and cardinals should promise in blood to observe it. It would still be wasted trouble and labor. They would only grow worse afterward than they were before, as happened after the Council of Constance. We have a predecessor, we have an example in history, the Council of Constance between 1514 and, uh, 1415 and 1418, where Jerome and Huss were killed, martyred. They say something out of the one side of the, out of their mouth, and they say the opposite out of the other side of their mouth. For since they believe that there is no God, no hell, no life after this life, and life and uh, live and die like a cow, saw, or other animal, as we can read in Second Peter 2 verse 12, it is to them ridiculous to keep seals and letters and reform. That is why 
That is why it would be best for the emperor and estates of the empire to let the blasphemous, abominable rascals and damned scum of Satan and Rome just go to the devil. There is no hope of achieving any good anyway. One has to handle it differently, for nothing, absolutely nothing, can be accomplished with councils, as we have seen in the past. The senseless fools imagine that we are in urgent need of their counsel, as if we or Christendom could do nothing without their counsel or office, so that they think that one must always run after them and that they can forever make fools and monkeys out of us. But that is not what we think, and, with God's grace, I will sing them another song. If they do not want to hold a council, they needn't, as far as we are concerned. We have no need of a council for ourselves. And if they are furious, they can do something in their pants and hang it around their necks. That would be a musk apple and patch them for such gentle saints. God does not think them worthy of bettering themselves or of doing any good, before they have been given up to a base mind, as we can read in Romans uh, 1.28. There you find the list of papal virtues, as in Second Peter 2. Let this be enough. In Pope Paul's briefs to the Emperor Charles V, it says further, quote, and you should know that it is not your prerogative to choose who shall be in the council, for that is the prerogative of our jurisdiction. Unquote. Did we already speak about this? I don't remember, because I spoke about that, of course, in German. But here in English we see that in the letter that the Antichrist wrote to the Emperor, of the Roman Empire, the German Charles V. And you should know that it is not your prerogative to choose who shall be in the council, for that is the prerogative of our jurisdiction. So, the Pope takes away the power of the Emperor to determine who should attend, who should be in that council. So when the emperor, when the temporal power has no say in how the council is formed and who is to attend or not, what do they have to say anyway? Nothing, right? All the power lies in the Pope, lies in the hands of the Pope, on the hands of the Antichrist. And that's the point that Luther is making all the time. That's the same one that he makes in his writing to the German nobility in 1520. Whether there is one council or ten or none, it does not be, uh, it is not of any significance, because the Pope determines everything of the councils. If there is a council, when it is held, where it is held, and who is attending, and who has something to say. And even if, even if people of secular power, like kings, and other nobility is to attend that council, they are made to swear beforehand that they will agree with everything that the Roman Catholic Church presents in that council, means all the bishops and cardinals. You can read that in Martin Luther's writing of 1520. I don't go there right now. You go there for yourself. Look it up for yourself. Martin Luther's letter to the Christian nobility in 1520. There he states absolutely this. These are the words of the Pope. And he repeats this in this little quote. And you, Emperor, should know that it is not your prerogative to choose who shall be in the council, for that is the prerogative of our jurisdiction. Now, gently, dear Pauli, Luther continues, dear donkey, don't dance around. Oh, dearest little ass, Pope, don't dance around. Dearest, dearest little donkey, don't do it. 
before the ice is very solidly frozen this year because there was no wind you might fall and break a leg if a fart should escape you while you were falling the whole world would laugh at you and say ah oh, the devil how the ass pope has befouled himself and that would be a great crime of less majesty against the holy seal room which no letters of indulgence or plentitude of power could forgive oh that would be dangerous so consider your own great danger beforehand hellish father dear one why shouldn't the emperor have authority to name at least several who should be in the council since the four principal councils of nicaea constantinople ephesus and chalcedon were not called by the popes as there was no pope yet at that time referring to the beginning of the video nor by bishops but solely by the emperors constantine theodosius the first theodosius the second and martian who assembled called and named the bishops to the council and themselves attended it yes we afterward established in our decretals that only the pope should convoke councils and name the participants but dear one is this true who commanded you to establish this who gave you the power silence you heretic what comes out of our mouth must be kept i hear it which mouth do you mean the one from which the farts come <laughs> you can keep that yourself or the one into what uh, into which the good corsican wine flows let a dog shit into that oh you abominable luther should you talk to the pope like this shame on you too you blasphemous desperate rogues and crude asses and should you talk to an emperor and empire like this Yes, should you melon and desecrate for such high councils with the greatest Christian emperors just for the sake of your farts and decretals? Why do you let yourselves imagine that you are better than crass, crude, ignorant asses and fools who neither know nor wish to know what councils, bishops, churches, emperors, indeed what God and his word are? you are a crude ass you ass pope and an ass you will remain luther does not take any prisoners of his words here he lets it all out i love him for this this book reads just wonderfully let it dog shit into that he says <laughs> And the Pope replies, Oh, you abominable Luther, should you talk to the Pope like this? Yes. Luther replies, Shame on you too, you blasphemous, desperate rogues and crude asses. And should you talk to an emperor and empire like this? You are a crude ass, you ass Pope, and an ass you will remain. Again, Martin Luther continues, besides these four great councils, there have been many others now and again in Greece, in Asia, in Syria, in Egypt, in Africa, which did not first confer with the Bishop of Rome about it. Oh, there have been many other councils in Greece, Asia, Syria, Egypt, Africa, which did not first confer with the Bishop of Rome about it, and were nevertheless good Christian councils, particularly those in which St. Cyprian and St. Augustine participated. Now, <laughs> I can of course not fully agree with Martin Luther here, because St. Cyprian and St. Augustine were not saints in the biblical sense, and they were teaching heretical lie, and they did not adhere to Sola Scriptura. So, but, you know, I forgive Martin Luther for that. Anyway, he says, Charles the Great to held councils in Frankfurt, and we are speaking about the Council of Frankfurt in 794, that rejected the veneration of pictures, a decision that was even approved 
by the Council of Nicaea in 787. The councils of Frankfurt and France, his son Louis in Aachen, Aix-la-Chapelle, a city on the border with Belgium in the west of Germany. The Council of Aachen, held in 18, uh, 816 and 817, under Louis the Pious, who lived between 814 and 840, was primarily concerned with organizational reforms in the church. So these councils were held by other emperors, and were, uh, these other emperors held councils too. Dear one, Martin Luther continues, should such bishops and emperors have done wrong, and should they be damned merely because this farting ass in Rome, what else can he do but fart, sets up out of his own mad head and farts out of his stinking belly that it is not fitting for the emperor to convoke a council or to decide or name who shall attend? Oh, how good the crude donkey feels. He is looking for someone who will lay a stick to his sack so that his loins will have to bend. In the second brief to Emperor Charles V, he wants to be a theologian, if one may call him that, and introduces the example of Eli in 1 Kings chapter 2, and First Samuel chapter First Samuel chapter two verses twenty seven through thirty six, who was punished for not having admonished his sons for their sins. So I'm just going to open my Bible here, the King James version, of course, and we will go to Second Samuel, First uh, Samuel, sorry, First Samuel chapter two. So I just have to go here. Excuse me for this little delay. I have not prepared this reading of this part of the Bible. And we are going through uh, verses 27 through 36 in the King James because it says here in the second brief to Emperor Charles V he wants to be a theologian and introduces the example of Eli in 1 Samuel chapter 2 verses 27 through 36 who was punished for not having admonished his sons for their sins. So we read um, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 27, quote, And there came a man of God unto Eli, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father, when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and mine offering which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel my people? Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that my house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me, for them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me I shall be lightly esteemed. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man with, uh, in thine house. And thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation in all the wealth which, the, uh, which uh, God shall give Israel, and there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. And the man of thine, whom I shall not cut out from mine altar, shall be to consume thine eyes, and to grieve thine heart, and all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age. And this shall be a sign unto thee, that shall come upon thy two sons, on Hopni and Phineas. In one day they shall die, both of them. And I will raise me up a faithful priest, 
that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left in thine house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread, and shall say, Put me, I pray thee, into one of the priest's offices, that I may eat a piece of bread. Unquote from 1 Samuel chapter 2. Now continue in the book. He too is obliged to admonish the emperor as his firstborn son, so that he would not also be punished, for it was to be feared that grave unrest and disagreement would arise in the church from the great evil committed by Emperor Charles at Spires, etc. Here once again the desperate rascal and scoundrel Paul III, with his hermaphrodites, talks gibberish, just as though no one knew what their hellish devilish doings in Rome were like, or how he himself, the insatiable bottomless pit of covetousness, Paul the Third, including his son, and you have to know that, of course, that Pierluigi Farnese, Cardinal Alexander Farnese, had four children when he became Pope Paul III in 1533. So that Paul, including his son, and we are speaking about his worldly son, carries on with the possessions of the church. No, his son does not sin, does nothing that his father Paul would have to punish. The cardinals, hermaphrodites and servants of the Roman see, quote, in their front parts men, in their back parts women. Yeah, aparte anteviri, aparte post mulier. In the front they are men, in the back they are women. They are hermaphrodites, as Luther calls them most of the time, means they have two sexes. That also means that they are sodomites. A hermaphrodite, a uh, two-sexed individual, can also be just another term for a sodomite. You know? And this is what Martin Luther wants to make clear here. in their front parts men, in their back parts women, are entirely clean and have no need of admonition. And as the poet Mantuanus writes of the Curia, and this is very interesting, here follows a translation of the original Latin uh, poem that is written by Mantuanus, and um, this follows here in Latin and is translated into English. In my German version, when I read this book, there was no translation. So I had to translate from the English into the German to give my German viewers an idea what Mantuanus wrote about here. And um, the interesting point is that Baptista Spagnolo Mantovano, who lived between 1448 and 1516, he was called the Mantunean. Uh, for his hometown, Mantuna, was a vicar general of the Carmelite order. Now, the Carmelites are a, another uh, monastical order of the Roman Catholic Church. This passage is found in the Calamites of our times on the seven deadly sins. Uh, seven deadly sins, wherever does the Bible speak of seven deadly sins? The Bible speaks of ten commandments, and when you break one, you break all, and that is a sin. The breaking of the law is a sin. The Bible doesn't make any difference between a venial sin and deadly sin, and like all the Roman Catholic Church teaching does. Uh, get your Bible out if you don't uh, Bible out if you don't understand it. So, on the calamities of our times, on the seven deadly sins, in that book that he wrote, um, that we can also found at Burma, he is who is a very interesting um, uh, historian because he is cited also a lot of times in the book. Uh, the history of the Je uh, the hidden history of the uh, of the Jesuits, uh, the secret history of the Jesuits from uh, Edmond Paris, um, that you can also follow on my channel in the future. Anyway, this Mantuanus wrote a poem in Latin that 
I will read to you now in the English version as it is translated in the book of Martin Luther against the Roman papacy and institution on the devil, of the devil on page 282. Here follows the quote. The house of Peter is decadent, defiled with luxury unrestrained. In this I am disclosing no secrets, I am telling nothing unknown. I crave permission to state matters of common knowledge. This is what the cities and peoples talk about. This is the scandal, the old established scandal throughout all Europe that is destroying good sound morality. Sacred land is given over the debauchees and the, whole, the, uh, the holy altar is made over to catamounts and the reverent temples of the gods serve the turn of Ganymedes. Why be surprised that their wealth grows and their fallen houses are rebuilt? The effeminate Arab sells bowls of scented incense. The Tyrians sell raiment, temples, priests, altars, holy things, wrath, fire, incense, prayers are on sale to us. Heaven is on sale and God himself. But all this is ancient history. Nowadays, Morals are good and sound. Unquote from the poem. Now Luther continues in the book. We in Germany are accused of being heretics, of destroying churches, monasteries, masses, the Roman and blasphemous idolatries. But just look at how they themselves, who teach such idolatry as true worship, deal with it in Rome. Look at the churches of St. Agnes, which previously had 150 nuns, St. Pancras, St. Sebastian, St. Paul, and all the rich monasteries and churches inside and outside Rome. Luther visited these churches in 1510, you have to understand. The Pope and Cardinals have grubbled up all of these, and now they come out to us and take hold of our churches and monasteries too, with Pallia, Anates, and many other robberies and extortations. In all of these and many other abominations for which God has destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah as well as many cities in every land by flooding water and shaking earthquake, here I say, the Holy Virgin St. Paul of the Third, the Pope, the Antichrist, has no conscience, no worry, no fear of God, that they might, like Korah, as we read in Numbers 16.32, be swallowed up into the earth. St. Paul III has no right to admonish us when they themselves invalidate the, mass, the many masses, virgils, canonical hours, and daily worship services, which they so uh, vociferously demand from us and about which they call us heretics when they are almost all much worse than Sodom and Gomorrah and live in a way that could not be more abominable. The Pope calls the real, true, Bible-believing, Jesus-following Christian a heretic because in Roman Catholic dogma, it is said that if you do not adhere to the power of the Pope, temporal and spiritual, when you don't adhere to Roman Catholic canon law, then you are a heretic. Whereas the Bible defines a heretic as someone who does not adhere to the word of God. But because, of course, the Pope says that he is God on earth, it is his word that counts and not the Bible, because the Pope stands above the Bible. You call us heretics when, or they call us heretics when they are almost all much worse than Sodom and Gomorrah and live in a way that could not be more abominable. Think of the time of today, 2017, where more and more pedophile, child molesting, and sodomite scandals of the Roman Catholic Church come above. If you do your research, you will see that the group of persons that has the most AIDS in the United States of America is among the, Romus, the Roman Catholic priests. 
there is no other profession that has more aids within their ranks than the Roman Catholic priests. How is that? Because they are sodomites. They are idolatrous. They were in the time of Luther, because he speaks of Sodom and Gomorrah. And they were before the time of Luther. They were after the time of Luther and they are still today in 2017, even today, the 24th of October 2017. But there is a great uproar about what Emperor Charles did at Spires. Antichrist Pope Paul III is worried about his son Charles, lest some great misfortune befall him. Now, Martin Luther again says about his son Charles, so he speaks about his spiritual son, that the emperor is the son of the, uh, of the pope, because the son is subservient to the father, right? So, uh, as Jesus Christ is subservient to the father in heaven, of course, the emperor is subservient to the Pope of Rome. That's why Martin Luther speaks of his son. But as I read to you before, this Pope Paul III had four real sons that he fornicated into this world. How can I say this otherwise? Because the Pope actually must live in celibate, because that's what the Roman Catholic Church teaches, so how can he have four sons, but that is historically proven. But here Luther calls the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire the son of the Pope. What then has his clear son Charles done at Spires? Well, he did not want to start a bloodbath in Germany, in which the devil, the Pope and the Cardinals would have loved to bathe, and which would have protected their hellish scum. Instead, he suspended the Edict of Worms from which all the unrest in Germany had come, and he did this so that they could resist the Turks, mean Islam, with a united front, as a pious Christian emperor should provide his fatherland with peace and protection. Yeah, first and for all, protect them from the enemy without, and then protect them from the enemy within. The problem is, the enemy within the Roman Empire, of which Charles V was the emperor at that time, the enemy within is the Pope, who gives even the emperor the power. So that's kind of a little bit of an impossibility to protect the empire from the enemy within. So he turned to the enemy without, which was the Turk, or Islam, when he was standing before the walls of Vienna at that time. This is what the scoundrel in Rome calls wrongdoing. Oh, dreadful sin! So what do the rascals call well done apart from what they do in Rome? From now on, the sun, S-U-N, is weary of shining on them and the land, as they themselves say, can bear them no longer. Genesis 13, verse 6. For thus I have heard it, said in Rome myself, quote, It is impossible that it should continue like this. It must break. Now we've reached 57 and a half minutes, and I'm going to stop the reading right here. Next time I will continue by probably going back and read this little last paragraph that we read right now. We have come to page 248. And I hope and pray that you were edified by this reading, that you were edified by the history lesson I gave you in the beginning about the history of the murderous Emperor Phocas, Boniface III, the Pope of Rome, the very first Pope of Rome, the Bishop of Rome, who admonished himself as universal bishop, instead, or, no, not instead, but even despite of the warning that was given by the Bishop of Rome that, suc uh, that, succeeded, uh, that uh, preceded him, uh, Gregory the Great, who said, Moreover, I say confidently that anyone calling himself universal priest, universal and Catholic are interchangeable words, Catholic priest, 
universal priest, universal bishop, or desires to be so called, shows himself by this self-exaltation, think of Isaiah 14, to be the forerunner to the Antichrist, because by this display of pride, he sets himself superior to others. Do your own studies on this, and you will see that I have been telling you the truth all along. Until next time, Jörg from Jogla 66, Hour of the Truth says goodbye, God bless you and bye bye. <laughs>